Thank you so much. I apologize for the delay. I was down in Hall 5 in an intense debate on New Vascular EMD, so I just rushed up. Thank you so much for staying back. Um, I've just got eight minutes to share with you about an important topic that I think is not often covered in a lot of retina sessions, about which is subthreshold laser. And basically, these are my financial disclosures. The only one of relevance is Quantel Medical, which I, I'm a, a consultant for them. Um, why do we still need laser for macular diseases? This is a perennial question I get in every single meeting I speak in, according uh, also with my subthreshold laser colleagues. Many countries, India especially, cannot un afford continuous unending intravitreal injections. Even newer agents like ferismab with better durability, the patients with new vascular MD are potentially needing injections for at least five to seven years. Increasing cases of DME, CSR, and proliferative retinopathy, without a doubt, you can see in, in, as our, our countries in Asia become more affluent, you have all the non-communicable diseases increasing. Many cases, no matter what you give them, are unresponsive to the drugs, whether it's um, the latest anti-VEGF or, or, or the earlier ones. So what do we really mean by subthreshold? This is another question that often confuses people. Subthreshold laser means that when you perform the laser at the macula, you do not see any visible changes. You do not see a scar. So you cannot see it with autofluorescence. You cannot see it with OCTA. You cannot see it with OCTA. You cannot see it with FFA. Whether you reduce the power or duration of laser mass, such as using endpoint management with other company software, whereby you see a, a, a burn at the beginning, at the end of the treatment, this is not subthreshold laser. There's a, now, uh, there was a, something called 2RT by Alex, which is no longer being used. They use very high power, but nanosecond duration. So the pulsing technology that I'm referring to has been around for almost 20 years. This is called by many names, uh, subminimal by Quantel, microsecond by ODOS, micropulse by Iridex, and smart pulse by Lumenis. How does it work? It works by changing the microenvironment of the retina, whereby you stimulate the RPE cells by a very low um, duty cycle power. You do not want to create a burn to kill the RPE cells, but you need enough energy to elicit a response. And this has been shown by many um, basic science studies where it's upregulation of matrix metalloproteinases in eyes treated with subthreshold laser, which leads to normalization of the, of the retinal vasculature and anatomy. What are the issues? We have many issues. They've been around for 20 years. Many doctors use different treatment parameters, and they've been publishing using 5%, 10%, 15% duty cycle, uh, different uh, spot size, different uh, number of spots, and, and et cetera. If you are starting micropulse or subthreshold laser next week, there's high risk that you're worried about overusing of power because you have to go up to 800 milliwatts sometimes for some patients, and, and you might feel that that's too high a power for macular laser. So there's a high risk of under-treatment when you're starting out. <clears throat> DME cases often present late because we've tried everything else, like injections and steroids, before you convert to laser. We have no trials comparing subthreshold laser versus anti-VEGF, primarily because it's very hard to fund these trials. So what we did during COVID time was a group of us founded the Subthreshold Optomic Laser Society to really understand and, and identify all these issues. These are the founding members, um, and I'm, I'm the treasurer of the society. Dr. Anand Rajendran from India, he's one of the executive committee members, and we're getting more and more members uh, throughout the world joining the society, whereby we discuss these sort of issues every month, and we run webinars and courses and etc. throughout the world. So the aim was really to con establish a consensus guidelines for subthreshold laser. And what we did was, among us, we sent um, a round of questions to all the experts in the committee. This was led by J.H. Chablani, and whereby we had one round and two rounds of questions, independent of whatever laser machine we device you use, they had to answer the questions. And for diabetic macular edema, the committee agreed whether you had center involving or non-center involving macular edema with or without anti-VEGF therapy, you use a 5% duty cycle, 200 millisecond pulse duration, 150 to 200 micron spot size with no spacing between the laser spot using an integrated pattern system. And you do titration. Titration means you go outside the macula, you get a visible burn, you reduce the power by 50%, and then treat the thickened areas that we use to visualize on OCT. You do not need to treat any focal areas of microaneurysm, only the edematous areas with subthreshold laser. 
you can treat the trophovia. This is a very common question. 5% duty cycle is extremely low power, and it's very safe to, to, to do it. You do not need any specific imaging studies to evaluate laser spots, um, but you do need to follow up the patients at six to eight weeks after the laser to look for resolution of the edema. Um, you, can, you can give ad, 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 adjunctive therapies or anti-VEGF or steroid according to your discretion. What about CSR? CSR is a big issue because of worldwide shortage of Visudine. It's very expensive to do PDT laser. Uh, despite some trials showing some evidence that half those PDT works, subthreshold laser remains a very effective modality when you treat your acute and chronic CSR patients. And we use exactly the same uh, protocol as you do for DME. So it's the same, you don't have to worry about that. Again, for CSR, you can treat over the fovea. You do need a fluorescein angiogram before laser to identify the hot spots. And then if you have a chronic CSR, treat the focal as well as diffuse uh, leakage uh, with the subthreshold laser. And you need to reevaluate at six to eight weeks. So this has been published in 2022, and you're welcome to, to uh, download this article. It's, a free, um, it's free to download from, from I. And again, I summarize in, in, the, in this table here, 5% duty cycle, 200 milliseconds spot size, um, um, duration 150 um, spot size, and no spacing between the spots. And you titrate and reduce 50% of duty cycle. So this is the website. You're welcome to scan the QR code. If you have any questions, if you wish to join the society, please, by all means, uh, go ahead. And before that, I'd like to welcome you to Malaysia in July. We are hosting the World Congress of Ophthalmology of Pediatric Ophthalmology. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, any questions uh, or any comments from the audience? Babu, you want to say something? You are part of the group. No, uh, while uh, Dr. Fung, uh, while using uh, this subthreshold, are you uh, saying that half reduction from the standard uh, power? Yeah, so titration means, um, okay, so the confusion is because some machine manufacturers advocate fixed power. No matter what, use the same power and just laser away. But it may work in a Caucasian eye, which is lightly pigmented. But in Asia Pacific, we have varying pigmentations, degrees of pigmentations in RPE. So you might be over-treating uh, Asian patients. So it's important to do the titrations. And you reduce it by 50% to avoid that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this we used to practice for a very long time in uh, CSR uh, patients. When you are titrating, you will use the space a nasal to the disc so that uh, you first give a grade to burn. Once grade to burn is there, then you reduce it by 50%. Correct, yes. Very and important. then you should come on to the area where the leakage is there and you or deliver the laser whether you get the burn or not. Yes, correct. That is subthreshold or we used to call photofermentation. Yep. This is the term we used to use before. Now it has come as subthreshold. Yep. This is How only main the idea is to stimulate the retinal pigment epithelium for enhancing the healing process. Otherwise what happens is the RPE is supposed to be sick RPE there and it do not function effectively for the barrier function. So if you are using a subthreshold laser, it will stimulate and uh, activate the RP so that healthy wound healing can happen in these cases. Uh, how about your results? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd just like to reiterate uh, what uh, Ken said. Uh, we started doing the study uh, as an LV Prasad uh, about five, six years ago. And then uh, the issue was about this fixed parameters. So like he mentioned, so if you check with some of our colleagues in Europe, they go by 400 milliwatts what's there on the label. The reason that does not work in Asiatic populations, pigmented exactly. populations, because you need to titrate because of the pigmentation. And that's why a lot of the cases then that we did did not work out. And that's where this kind of, uh, this uh, this modality fell into kind of disrepute because people were using different modalities. Yeah. So this is why our salt group has now, uh, you know, we've fixed certain parameters. No. And earlier, the publications which you'll see were all largely with 810. 
then we just diode. So you find a lot of uh, uh, material in with yeah, diode. Yeah. But with yellow, which is far more macular friendly, uh, things are coming up now. And we feel this is, while it is effective right now for SIG RP and CSCR, we are seeing great results now. I think this is going to be a game changer more for diabetic macular edema and putting some sort of a cap on the repetitive in, uh, injection. So I think this is going to be a big uh, No, while using the, the subthreshold, certain times what, within the eye also, there is some areas where the pigmentation is more and some areas it is less. That's why you need to check two, uh, two three areas. And depending upon the pigmentation, you need to titrate. it. That's the basis for titration, requirement of titration. It is very much varied even with the, the same patient. That's why Absolutely. it is also a different same patient with different points Areas, of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different 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 same patient, same eye, different points of time. Time also. Uh, exactly. Two years later, it might be Agreed. different. Uh, that Absolutely. is why we are getting a different result. There is another person who is waiting. Ah. Can, can you? Ah, yeah. What percentage of patients okay. do? So, yeah, I only have eight minutes to present the guidelines, but essentially to run through all the results uh, would take another 30 minutes. But we have, there has been a meta-analysis published. You may want to check on that. Uh, for both CSR and DME, we showed that um, there was about a significant reduction in vision and improvement in visual acuity with the laser. As to regards combination therapy with anti-VEGF, there's been very little published on it. Because no, there's been no trial. What he's asking is, you are doing repeated injections and yeah. now you committed for subthreshold laser. In what percentage of patients you avoided repeat injections? In my hands, it's about 20% you avoid repeat injections. So, you know, if you, if you treat it early, again, like I had my earlier slide, if you had a patient that's at DME for five years with everything thrown at them and then you're sending it to me for laser, I can guarantee you it won't work. So I, I think it, it is a question of chronic, acute, and what was the situation. But the majority of patients will have a response. It's fair enough. See, even if we are uh, having a, a patient with repeated injections, even 20%, if you avoid repeated injections, it's a big gain. It's a big gain. So it's a treatment modality option you are having. That's what he's uh, driving. Or no? Not for DME. At this moment of time, no. I think DME, anti vegf is the first line. CSR, yes. CSR. Especially center involving DME. Yeah. See, because he, here, a lot of people are sitting. So uh, we don't want to give a wrong message yeah. so that tomorrow they all start practicing again subthreshold laser for this. Center involving DME injections are the first line of management. It's away from the center. Depending upon the confidence that where the leaking is there, laser can be attempted as a first line. If it is a diffuse diabetic macular edema, injections are the first line treatment. Second line, if there is a repeated injections and a lot of burden is happening on the patient, option of subthreshold is there for you to explore. And you have a 20% chance of success in avoiding the injection. It's not 80%. Rest of the 80% may still require repeated injection. That's you need to understand. Uh, the next question, yeah. Yeah, yes. Dr. Das. Years back, may I remember, one of the eminent retina specialists of India, Dr. Vijayanand Patnaik, he was advocating this retina, this uh, uh, moment is. Yes, photo fermentation. It is same. Yes, same thing. thing. It is same. fermentation. There was, uh, there was also sometimes when we never used to see leaks, there was off the leak photocoagulation, like you do fermentation of that. Those were the history. Uh, one thing one has to realize that when you are deciding that waiting for the patient to become better metabolically, can we start? And that's a question to you. If the patient is metabol metabolically not stable, and uh, is it safe to start the micropulse? 
yeah, because they, that is, it doesn't have any systemic if, side effects. You, I mean, like all diabetic patients, they need to be stable, but if they are not, if they're contraindicated for having an injection, high blood pressure, yeah, and because glucose. renal failure, yeah, renal yeah. thing, so are they safe for this kind of yeah, micropulse? I think they are. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. no reason why you can't try laser. I think that yeah. that's a big thing one has yeah. to understand that well, these no, no. fish. What, what we need to highlight is, even if you go for subthreshold laser, tell the patient that if you are not going to get controlled, then we cannot help you. Us. This no, no, no. statement need to come, otherwise they will not take the treatment, systemic treatment no, serious. That, that is that's the primary one has to take. Uh, any more questions from the audience, please? Dr. Patnaik was advocating this autopomentation for CSCR. Yeah, yeah, yes, we, yes, we know yes. that, sir. Uh, yes, we have uh, <laughs> almost come to uh, end of this uh, second uh, session of Retina Suspeciality Day, and um, the, the third session will go going to come now, but yes. I would like to thank the chair, uh, Dr. Prashant Agnihotri, and then uh, the like, rest of the yeah. chairpersons thank and you. moderator thank you. Thank for you a very so lively Ajit. session, and a uh, uh, lot of people uh, got advantage yeah. out of this session. Yeah. I and think I, I thank all the delegates for acting.